Orson Welles, meet Rose McClendon. We're mounting a Scottish play. In Harlem. For Negro Theatre. We want you to direct. You land the role of Orson Welles in your first feature film. What is the first source you go to beyond the script and why? With this particular role, one of the nice things is that I only needed to uh, focus uh, for me um, on his early years. So I, I did some research, read some books, tried to find as much information as possible when it came to what his early years were like, because we're just dealing from his birth up until like 20 years old. Right. And what was fascinating to see is that that the the legend, the myth, the iconography, uh, that personality was very much there, even from a from a young age, yeah. described as very much like a savant uh, by his teachers and mentors. Uh, so that chutzpah that that he had, he had from the get go. In looking at archival or Wells films, did you notice anything about his character or bearing or quirks that you brought into your own interpretation? Uh, for me, more than anything, I focus on the spirit and the psychology uh, of them. For example, I knew from the moment I got cast to the moment we started uh, filming was about two weeks. And I knew that I wouldn't really be able to do a full, yeah. So I knew I wouldn't, I didn't really have the time to do a physical transformation to look as much like him as I, as I could. And, and if you, if you look at my kind of like facial structure and body type and, and, and his, there are very obvious differences, but I know when they were casting the, the film, I think it came down between me and a, another actor. And there was one actor that looked more physically like uh, them, but I was more true to the spirit and uh, the personality. And for me, it really freed up my performance because I had no time to worry about whether or not I was gonna get it uh, exactly perfect. And I think that when you're uh, portraying a historical figure like this, you know, wanting to get it right and worrying about how everybody's gonna receive it weighs heavily on every single actor, but I didn't have time. I had to just focus on the work and focus on his personality and quirks. And uh, that's what I focus on the most. And I did look at footage uh, of recordings from him when he was older to see if I could uh, reverse engineer any kind of quirks or the ways right. that he spoke. Uh, I, would, I watched um, the way he delivered Shakespeare, particularly, uh. um, as indicative of the time. And that kind of informed my approach um, with one particular monologue in the middle and that when you look at someone, how they talked, it's like, oh, th this is very much who you were. It just kind of morphed over time. Of course, you're also portraying him in the boy genius stage, you're right, 21 years old. Uh, what in his biography before that age struck you as a motivating force in his rapid rise to the top of the showbiz ladder? He had already made himself a name as an authorita uh, authoritative figure within um, Shakespeare circles. Uh, I mean, heck, this is a this was a kid who at sixteen walked into an Irish uh, rep company with zero resume, but walked in with all of the bravado as someone who'd been around for so long. And because he walked in with that kind of confidence, the the people running the audition they had his number. They knew he had no experience; was underage. But they were like, "We'll give you an audition because we're amused." And then he presented how much talent he actually had. He had worked with John Houseman on a couple of productions already. He had started branching off into radio. He had expressed, because he had this relationship with John, he had already expressed an interest in directing. And because with this particular, you gotta remember too, at this per uh, time period, black actors, the opportunities oftentimes that they were giving were more like song and dance shows. And they were, they were hungry to prove their mettle. And one of the best ways that you can demonstrate, like, this is not just us, we have so much more gravitas and stories that we can tell is through Shakespeare. And I think John knew that if anyone had the, again, the chutzpah to go about this, it was Orson. Wells was a man of excess in women, food, obviously, and in your portrayal, alcohol. Again, in your work on the character, what do you feel was, were the roots of that excess? And how did it play into his art? I think that it is very, it's very common in history for extremely brilliant, obsessed, 
and focused artists who uh, are committing their entire being to a vision to go to extremes. You know, I think a lot of times people use substances as a way to self-medicate and to balance the intensity that they're bringing to things. It's not ever that he was ever intentionally, intentionally trying to cause malicious harm or do anything to, to other people. He was all about the work. He was all about the story. And that intensity needs a shutoff valve at times. I think a lot of young artists get caught up on that to their detriment. Um, a period in film is a daunting task, especially on a lower budget arena. What were the clever things the filmmakers did to keep 1935 legitimate? And what was your favorite? Well, one of the, the coolest aspects of this film that I think really speaks volume to how it reads on uh, screen was because Warner Brothers um, uh, put up a, a good portion of the, of the money for the film, we got access to their prop department. Oh. And I think they thought, I think they thought we were just gonna take just like one truckload. But our, our, uh, our art department knew that, especially in this early in their career, they probably would not have access to this resource again in the same manner. So they brought three trucks and they took as much as possible. Oh, wow. And they used as many of those pieces. Every time we got caught back on, we were, the cast, we were just amazed at the richness. So that immediately put us in the world and you can just see it on screen. It really makes such a big difference. I noted that there were three directors on the film. How did that setup work on the set? And since this was your first feature, did you find it challenging in any way? Well, actually it was more challenging than three because we had 10. We had wow. 10 directors. We had wow. 10 directors. Each directed about 10 minutes, uh, give or take, 10 to 12 minutes of the film. Uh, and it was challenging, but the it really speaks to the spirit of collaboration. This was the mountain that we all knew we faced when creating this. How do you create a cohesive film and narrative, both in, in visual and with the storytelling when you have 10 different directors? Uh, this was something that was talked about ad nauseum before we got on set. Uh, I really need to um, recognize our, our, the incredible communication between our directors and producers. We had such incredible communication across the board with all departments. Everybody had their eye on every single detail. Nobody relied on them being the sole voice. Uh, nobody relied on just one department. Uh, and it really speaks volumes and it's, it shows with the film. In your career, uh, what type of role or genre do you hope casting agents will consider you for in the sense of how you feel as a performer? Uh, when it comes to dramatic stuff, I, I tend to be drawn towards characters that are deeply flawed and are moving through their inequities, especially characters that are trying to prove themselves or have something redeemed in them. I, I like the complexity of, of that. People that are moving through the darkness to try to grow through it. Um, and those are things I tend to gravitate towards. I, I tend to gravitate towards characters that are deeply, deeply uh, passionate. And uh, so for me, this, this role was very much like a, like a hand in glove thing. I even, when I saw the breakdown, even though I knew I didn't look quite like Orson, I knew that he was immediately in my uh, wheelhouse. So when, uh, when people uh, see what this is, I want them to know this is what I could do uh, within two weeks uh, work of prep for a film that shot over 25 days with 10 directors. So just think about what I'm, what I'm capable of <laughs> under uh, more normal auspices. And I'm just excited to grow from here. Final question. If Orson Welles were to invite you to a celestial lunch, what would be the first question you'd ask him? I think I, my first question would be probably, if you had the opportunity to go back and do Citizen Kane all over again, and I think Citizen Kane was obviously brilliant, but he spoke so much about how that film dogged him for the rest of his life. And it's not his, it, in my opinion, it's not his fault. I think it's very understandable for any artist to go through the difficulty of, of making that and what, and what followed after um, for you to feel like you can't ever top that or else, or also that you can't ever come out from the shadow of something, whether it be good or bad. 
So I, I would want to know how would he approach that process differently and what stories were still in him to make that he never did. This is Patrick McDonald for HollywoodChicago.com, copyright 2022.